So we are live. We, right. we are live. All right. Well, hello, everyone. We are going to get started. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, welcome to our Viral and the Vaccine War Q&A with the film's director and producer and the medical director of Siri. I'm Murphy Anderson and I'm the project, I'm a project manager at uh, NDSU Center for Immunization Research and Education, also known as Siri. We are housed under the Department of Public Health, so happy National Public Health Day, everyone. And we are sponsoring the film screening. Uh, this Q&A is actually a complement to that. So the film is now available to stream through next Wednesday, April 12th. We hope that you're able to watch the film, encourage your networks to do the same. And if you've already watched it, thank you. And we hope that you enjoyed it as much as we did. Virulent is really about the roots and the consequences and nuances surrounding vaccine hesitancy and denial. And you know, since the onset of COVID-19, I think we've all noticed really the increase in anti-vaccination rhetoric, sentiment, misinformation, and how this all is really, you know, bleeding into various uh, places in our lives. And that's what we're here to talk about today, the making of this film, but also the topics within it. So uh, before I introduce our guests, here's just a few logistics. This is a Q&A, and um, even though we have some questions queued up, we really want to hear from you. So please put your questions into the Q&A box, and we've got a great turnout today. We're almost at 50 attendees and climbing, uh, and so we'll do our best to answer as many as we can with the limited time that we have. So please keep them brief, and just a note that this meeting is being recorded. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our special guest. We have Laura Davis. She is the executive producer of the film. Jardis Gradanis, the director, editor, and cinematographer of the film. And Dr. Paul Carson, who is uh, the medical director at the Center for Immunization Research and Education. So thanks, you guys, so much for joining us today. Glad to be here. Right. Um, so again, you know, uh, you can feel free to uh, throw your questions into into the Q and A box. I'm going to get us started though with the first question, while everybody kind of thinks about what what they want to talk about today. And this this question I th is really for Laura and Jardis. Um, you know, Virulent isn't the first film that you've directed and produced about vaccines. You have another documentary called A Shot to Save the World about Salk's polio vaccine, which was released uh, back in 2020. And you might even be working on another one. So I'd love to know kind of what interests and inspires you about vaccination and the topics surrounding it. Shall I start, Charles? Sure, go ahead. For me, it's simple. I grew up in Pittsburgh, which was where Jonas Salk developed his polio vaccine. And I was proud to have been from a city that my parents, my dad, who was a doctor especially, made me understand was one of the, you know, it was one of the, truly one of the milestone achievements of 20th century medicine. And I joke, but this is true. Jonas Salk was for me number one in Pittsburgh. You know, Mr. Rogers was a distant second, although actually I came to admire him very much too. Um, so, I mean, I think that says it all. Vaccines are one of the, truly one of the milestones, I mean, of modern medicine, and, you know, and actually they, they go back even before modern medicine, but it's during the 20th and 21st century that we've, uh, that we've had these incredible breakthroughs. Yeah, what struck me about it was that, you know, the Jonas Salk story is such an inspiring story, right? It was everybody working together. There was the March of Dimes from, from FDR, everybody, you know, would donate their their dimes in order to fund all this and and so i mean vaccine hesitancy wasn't really on our radar really you know i think we finished the film in 2013 and then so a few years later we started thinking you know so what is this with all this this hesitancy you know and at that point this is before COVID, um it was about chicken pox and measles and you know things like that we would have you know small little pockets of of you know in the united states that we would have you know, an outbreak of, of something. So we started doing the documentary as a kind of an update to, to the Salk vaccine. And then of course COVID happened. So it completely exploded. 
um, you know, it became this really on, on, you know, on everybody's mind, you know, and, and I think it really kind of gave an opportunity also to the, to the anti-vaxxers to, to essentially, you know, co-opt, um, uh, you know, vaccine hesitancy in a way and really put it in the forefront. This is what they had been rehearsing for. So, I mean, what really was interesting for us was, was, um, was how many you know tentacles there are in so many different fields as far as politics is going, uh, you know, so the whole left and right issue, and then there's conspiracy theories which have just exploded as well, and we just kind of felt it had its fingers in everything, you know, in everything that we care about today. So you know, it became this very, very you know, you know, timely thing actually that we were doing it, and and it was tricky doing it also because. At, you know, it we were in a pandemic in real time. You know, something that hadn't happened. I think you know probably since since uh, the Salk. You know, since since um, uh, you know polio was a real was a real problem. So it you know it was like being on a moving platform in a sense. I mean, we we were trying to keep up with the news as as it was happening. Yeah. So uh, that really gave us an insight as well. Yeah, and uh, I'll just add to that that. We thought, well, maybe there won't be a need for this film because, you know, before COVID, uh, I mean, we just started filming two or three months before we knew the word COVID. And the physicians, experts that we were interviewing, they were talking about what Ebola looked like in West Africa and other pandemics in other countries to try to, or the 1918 flu, you know, worldwide and in this country too. Um, and then suddenly we all knew, and there was this hopeful moment, and Paul Offit, Dr. Paul Offit, who was one of the main speakers in the film and also the project medical advisor, he said, I really thought that with COVID and then this race to develop a vaccine, that this might finally be the turning point, that the anti-vaxxers would recede and people would realize how great vaccines are. And of course, he admits he was completely wrong. And that's too bad. I'm sure he uh, is frustrated, more frustrated than those of us who have come to the subject more recently. And I'd love to know just a bit more how you had to shift your approach. So you, when you, you know, at the beginning of the film, there's this in introductory text that says we were already filming something about vaccine hesitancy and then COVID-19 hit. Take us to that time where and and how you may have had to to pivot a little bit to address address yeah. what was happening. Chartis, what do you remember? Like, what do you actually remember? I remember it, certain things. <laughs> well, the, the main story that I remember actually, you know, I mean, I mean, it, oh, the big question always is how do pe people make their decisions? You know, and this was really illustrated by something uh, that happened to us when we were coming back from a shoot from uh, from Pittsburgh. Actually, we had interviewed people in Pittsburgh. We came back. We had all this equipment. And we're in LAX, you know, at the, at the airport, hailing a cab. And it was this lady who was hailing, you know, who was, who was hailing Ubers. Actually, we're looking for an Uber, who who asked us about the equipment. And we said, well, you know, we're making a film about vaccines. And she me immediately assumed that it was an anti-vax film, you know. And 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 that's the thing that struck us too. Like if you know, if you look at Netflix or you look, you know, where films are available. They're all anti-vax films. There, there were very, you know, there's, there's very few films actually that address this and and take a deep dive into it because we've now all heard, you know, essentially all the cliches that have been trotted out by the media, but they don't, you know, do a deep dive into it. So this lady, you know, she said, "Oh yeah, you know, I, you know, I just told, you know, my friends, you know, we just had a baby. Don't get your kid vaccinated." Now think about this. This is a kid. This is a lady who is, you know, very, very young, very nice. And but hailing Ubers. Essentially <laughs> advising her friend who's hailing hailing Ubers and she's and, and she's giving advice to her friend. So that really struck us that it is about, you know, most people listen to their peers, unfortunately. And of course, the, the internet. I mean, that has really just, you know, fed this machine, I think. Uh, so that is one of the things that I remember, Laura. Right. And by the way, what I thought of when you asked that question is we, you know, for a while, we really weren't sure what we were going to do. And then we were chasing the story, trying to figure out, as Jardis said, what was happening in real time. But that trip, that particular trip was the first time we got on a plane after the pandemic was a thing. Mm -hmm. And we were dressed in hazmat suits. There is many <laughs> of us. Thank God we decided not to include that in the film. We looked ridiculous. But 
Hmm. Dr. Carson, I, I think this could be something that you could chime in on. You know, you've been working in infectious disease vaccination for a long time, and we know that vaccine hesitancy has always been there. But COVID nineteen, as we've been talking as we're talking about, is a whole new ball game. Um, did you anticipate this level of um, anti-vaccination sentiment, vaccine hesitancy, when people started talking about COVID-19 development, or what What do you remember about that time? Yeah, I think I have to say, honestly, we in our center were worried about this right from the beginning. Um, you know, I think we, we, we were worried from the start that there might be some substantial pushback on what was going to need to be a very rapid rollout, a very wide scale rollout of a novel vaccine. Um, but I did not anticipate the level to which anti-vaccination sentiment would grow and, and become almost militant and generalized now to almost all vaccines in the wake of COVID. It, that was truly remarkable. Absolutely. And uh, this is a question from an audience me member. Uh, Leah says that she really enjoyed the film and uh, she feels like the individuals who are on the front um, end of the anti-vax movement almost reminds her of predators preying on the vulnerable. Do you think that is an intention of, of their movement? Well, Dr. Carson, I'm actually dying to hear your take on this. I've I've struggled with this a lot. So I, I think I think the the people like the Dell Big Trees, um, there's gold in them. Their hills. I mean, they're 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 mine. You know, they're making some big bank off of some of this stuff. But I'm I'm more fascinated by some of the medical voices there that are kind of on the fringe that were were you know physicians sometimes even with academic credentials, uh, uh, kind of on the margins. I would say that have come out this way. And I've, you know, with big anti-vaccination sentiment, and I've wondered, are, do they really believe this? Um, it, it, or is it, is it become pre, purely mercenary because you, you know, they're, they're sort of rock stars into a, a segment of the population. Um, I don't know, but I, I think there is something very intoxicating about when you, when you speak for that group and you have this, this, um, swell of people who, you know, lionize you and you get invited to speak on, you know, uh, conservative media channels or, and <clears throat> get asked to come give talks around the country and around the world. I think that may be very intoxicating and, and help uh, people sort of delude themselves, you know, physicians and, and media personalities are not immune to their own cognitive biases, something that you you kind of touched on in the in the film. Um, that and I think the fact that there is monetization out of it now, I, I think, <clears throat> can explain a lot of it. But I I do think some of these people are sincere in their beliefs. And you you had some of the commentators speak to that as well, that there are people, you know, that 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 people have legitimate deep concerns about the safety, efficacy, and necessity of these vaccines. Um, and um, th those are understandable and need to be met with compassion and with the proper tools to help communicate. Um, but these big media voices, uh, the, the, the physicians that are spokespeople, I, they are a mystery to me. And I, I'm just speculating on what I think might be behind some of that. I think it feels good to be part of a movement. I mean, you're talking about the leaders, and of course, I, I agree with everything you just said. But you know, Chartis and I, when we, uh, when Chartis and I were up in in Sacramento covering one of the many protests against the uh, legislation that Dr. Richard Pan introduced, uh, they are so good at organizing these things. I mean, it was like really kind of fun if you ignored the fact that you've got like proud boys mixing with RV driving retirees and parents who actually had their kids out of school on a school day and they make it almost festive. I hate to say that. That woman, Julie, that we interviewed, you know, the one who's Jewish, but thinks everything's a Jewish conspiracy. I don't, I forget, did we say in the film that she is Jewish? That was the weirdest thing about her, but um, <laughs> like, that's what they say about us. I'm Jewish too, you know what I mean? And yet there she was sort of buying into the whole Soros and the Jews controlling 
the world and you know, including vaccines, but, but she was so passionate about it. I mean, in, in some ways, I mean, it was almost innocent, you know, how much, how great it was to be around people just like you who, who get what people like us don't get. And so I understand that feels good because there's no rally or protest, that wouldn't be the right word, but there's nothing for us to go to. We can go, yay, science, we love vaccines. I'm so glad I don't have whatever. You know, you know if I could comment on something you just alluded to, Laura, um, you, you know, Paul Offit in another uh, um, talk, not, not in the film, uh, um, has the statement that, you know, conspiracy theories sort of make sense out of chaos. Mm. There's sort of a clear path out of, out of chaos. Mm -hmm. And the science on conspiracy theories is that they usually arise when there's a lot of confusion, when there's, a, there's competing voices, um, when it's often something that has major impact or potential major impact, and when people feel powerless. Um, and you, you touched on something that you just said, is that you now are part of a group. You're part of the cognizanti. You're part of an empowered group that sees what the other kind of people, sheep out there aren't seeing. It's empowering. And, and I, I think you're right on that, that, uh, that being a part of that, um, it, it, even if it seems like a preposterous conspiracy theory, makes some sense out of the chaos and puts you in a, in a sort of empowered group. But would you agree, Dr. Carson, that most of the people, not the leaders or the ones that are you know, frenzied enough to go to every protest, I found that the people like the Corys and the Kathys, Corey is the doula in the film that has the multicolored yeah. hair and Kathy is an, a slightly older woman, mother of eight. Um, I don't think they bought into the really crazy 5G chips in your brain or your blood stuff, yeah. but they're just scared and they didn't want to yeah. hurt their kids. Right. And, and so yeah. they're not the ones that, that's yeah. not the ones kind of buying in the conspiracy there. I actually loved, um, I'm, I'm sorry, what was the doula's name again? Corey. Corey. Because at the beginning, I was like, whoa, you know, what, where is she going? Or what, you know, right. what is she doing? <laughs> and she had one, I think, the best statements at the end of the film. And I'm probably, you can quote me better, but it was like, you know, sort of the ability to change your mind, you know, to look at things and have the ability to change your mind, which I thought was great. Um, and I think that's where probably most people are. A lot, yeah, it's not, it's not, unreasonable to have had concerns about a novel vaccine that has a scary sounding, you know, it's RNA. Well, that's kind of like DNA. And what's that actually doing? And, and it was rolled out at warp speed, operation yeah. warp speed. And these terrible are name. right. Terrible name. Um, it's those, those are not unreasonable concerns. Um, but, and it was, I think, great to see people that, that were, are like normal people wrestling with that. Um, you know, coming to, thankfully, I think, good conclusions at the end. But Yeah, yeah. what made that button especially work, I think, is is because people see themselves in that. You know, you could really relate to this, to this woman, right? She was just like a regular person, you know, she had tattoos and she was, you know, uh, uh, you know, she, she, people could see themselves in it, I think. So then you can, and if she can change her mind, you know, she was obviously a smart, bright woman. Uh, it, it's one of the reasons why I put it at the end <laughs> as a button, but thank yeah. you. It's very good. And bright and with, you know, five or six unvaccinated kids. Yeah, and exactly. finally really gave it some thought, you know, it's hard. And we all hate to admit, including myself, we all hate to admit that we're wrong, even to ourselves, let alone to others. Absolutely. This, um, just digging a little bit deeper into that as well. Um, this is maybe for Jardis when you conducted the, the interviews, you know, we, we saw throughout um, um, in a number of folks kind of um, their movement across the vaccine hesitancy continuum. And so how did you go about facilitating the sharing of these stories? Um, and then what, if anything, did you learn from them as you were doing this? Yeah, I mean, I, I should say uh, Laura is the one who conducted all the interviews. I was the guy behind the camera. 
So, so I mean, just for my part, and I, I would let you answer that, Laura, you know, how, how you answer. found people. We, we and, are almost yeah, like but, a unit here. Uh, you know, what was great about, I mean, you're always as a filmmaker, and look, I'm, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, you know, but I think, uh, you know, what we were just trying to bring to it was storytelling, right? That's that's our craft, and that's what we could do and 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 help with. But I think, you know, then it becomes very much about, we had about 70 hours worth of interviews, you know? And, and I would say, you know, we had probably, you know, eight of those interviews who were just terrific, you know, gold, kind of stuff that, you, that you're really hoping for. Smart people, articulate people, because you can be smart and not articulate at the same time. Um, and, and so then it becomes about with that much material and trying to crunch it into a 90 minute film, it becomes about kind of, you know, um, uh, picking snippets. Uh, and and building a story out of, out of something that is kind of usefully representative of all the issues, you know, and and so you're trying to kind of pull out all those layers because there's a lot of layers to to it, you know, obviously. And and again, you know, people usually make decisions uh, emotionally. So so that was kind of my part of it to, to is to be able to to work that together. But you know, Laura did all the research about about more of the science and and doing the real digging so she's the one who asked the question so i'll turn it over to look to you now laura no i mean i think you really said it and by the way i know nothing about science i mean i'm just a you know man or woman on the street when it comes to science um and you know when i go to the university of google i at least try to hit up you know the NIH or Cleveland Clinic or the Mayo Clinic, not, you know, whatever uh, people do for five minutes that they think makes them experts. But I, I know enough to know what I don't know. I think what I did learn or what surprised me most making this film was I did have an idea that most people that were vaccine hesitant, skeptical, whatever you want to call it, not confident, were crackpots. And I realize now that even though it's the crackpots have a very loud voice, um, I realize how many of these people, like Kathy, that mother I referred to, she could be my friend. You know, we're around the same age, and she's smart and fun to be around, and she's that. But she believed all this stuff, and I, I, I that would have driven me crazy if we had been friends. But my point is, she's just someone you could be friends with, a you know, normal person. And Dr. Carson, um, how about there are, this is a question from, from an audience member, there are a number of, of physicians on both sides, you know, we look at, we look at the um, physicians and some of MDs, some of PhDs on both sides saying, you know, yes, get a vaccine, no, don't get a vaccine. How do we, like, how do you approach that? What do you say to people that are like, well, this doctor said I shouldn't get it? Yeah, I had many family members do just that. Um, you know, Paul, you got an MD. Well, I've, I found this guy who's got an MD uh, on the internet who says they're dangerous. <clears throat> um, so uh, this, is, this is very challenging. Uh, one thing I think you can start with is just sheer numbers. At the very beginning of the pandemic, or, or not beginning of the pandemic, the beginning of the vaccine rollout, before any mandates were put out, um, uh, the AMA did a survey of physicians across the United States, and 96% of physicians had received the vaccine immediately with the rollout, before any mandates, um, you know, right away. So you're talking about wh whoever's sort of not, and the 4% who constitute the ones that didn't get it immediately were looking at it and just wanted to see a little, a lot of them just wanted to see a little bit more data. So you're talking about a very razor thin uh, number of you know, physicians that would be in that camp of like, these are dangerous, these aren't safe, um, these these aren't necessary, these aren't effective, what, whatever the case may be. Then the ones that are really putting themselves out there um, in a in a overt way, um, I've struggled with how, how to contend with. We on the back end put a lot of information kind of countering the things they, they say. Um, I asked Paul Offit when he did a seminar for us, do you think we should be debating them, you know, like on an open forum? And he was like, very much opposed to that, like not giving a stage or oxygen to people who you think are really dangerous, you know, putting dangerous ideas out. So there is sort of limits of, um, you know, 
orthodoxy's tolerance of heterodoxy as the way I mean that's fan, fancy words to say like how, we're not going to entertain flat earth society people you know it's all talking about stuff um on the, the other hand though I talk to people about take a look at at credentials okay MD is sort of a, or a PhD or a scientist is a starting point are they an expert in the field that they're talking about You'll you'll almost find no infectious disease doctors or infectious disease epidemiologists. I, I can't I can't think of a one that is 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 one of these voices. Second, um, if if they have specialty training in the area that they're talking about, are they recognized by their peers as an expert? Have they published on this? Have they done work on this in the past? Have they done a body of work? You see, like Paul Offit in your film, has this you know decades of work in this area. <clears throat> um. Uh, third or fourth or whatever I'm on, do they profit by what they're saying? Are they selling something? <clears throat> um, you can now go and find Dr. Peter McCullough, you know, is on a website where he's selling Dr. McCullough's spike boost, you know, um, which is some vitamins and supplements and stuff. Yeah, they're, they're directly marketing and profiting. Of it. Do they have a conflict of interest? And if they do, is it disclosed? Mm -hmm. um, and then last, I would say, are, are, are they speaking with nuance? I mean, if, if they're dogmatic about something and don't recognize um, the, the sort of debate, you know, what's the give and take, what's the pros and cons, but it's just this very dogmatic thing, your, your antenna should be up that this, this is something not quite right. Last one, I would say, are they giving their information more on political websites and political media, or are they debating it in scientific forums? If, if mostly where you see them is on, you know, uh, some strident, uh, you know, conservative or liberal media or whatever, as opposed to in the medical journals or on medical websites, your antenna should be up that something's not, not quite right there. This is not probably your best source of information. Well, I, this 30 minutes has flown by and I want to end uh, with Laura and Jardis and we'd love to know just what's next for you guys. Um, do you have anything that you can share with us in the work so we can follow and support you? Um, well, Chartis, that would be uh, you, because I'm like taking it easy. I'm on easy street. <laughs> <laughs> I started uh, working actually since we finished a film about for the last year or so, uh, a documentary about charisma, which completely fascinates me. You know, I mean, for good and for bad, right? Because it is one of those things that we're talking about, it, it's irrational in many ways, right? Why do people follow uh, a particular person? So, and I'm really talking about the 1% because I mean, you know, it's a term that is bandied about so much these days. Everybody's charismatic, you know, you can become more charismatic by checking these seven boxes kind of thing. But I'm talking about the 1%, you know, people who are able to change, you know, either for the better or for the worse. So I've been interviewing, uh, you know, evolutionary psychologists and and psychologists and and historians and political scientists, and it's a fascinating thing. And and it's also bottomless. It is like, is like the vaccine, you know, question in a sense, right? Uh, because there's a certain point where 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 it leaves science behind, and you go into kind of you know a mysterious, mystical primal thing. So yeah, it's a very interesting thing. And so timely as well, because of the, you know, the, the populism and the tribalism that is happening in the world, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's a very interesting thing to look at. I was just going to say, it sounds actually very relevant, perhaps to, to the anti-vaccination movement and the pro-vaccination yeah. movement as well. So yeah. Um, we will be looking out for that and let us know how we can how we can support you in that endeavor. Um, and I just want to let everybody know that uh, the film is now is again, like I said at the beginning, it's now available to watch. Um, um, you probably received an email, but it will be up on our website here soon. Um, and you can just search for NDSU Center for Immunization Research and Education. This will also do a, um, we'll also post this Q&A recording as well on our YouTube page. And there were so many good questions in the chat. I wish that um, we could have gotten to all of them. And if you would like us to, to follow up on your questions, please feel free to email us, ndsu.siri at ndsu.edu. Uh, and we'd be happy to uh, to answer them for you that way. Yeah. 
And I'll say the same thing if you have questions about and the movie. Oh, sorry. I think Murphy froze. Is she frozen for the rest of you? She is frozen. Okay. I'll just say to the people that are watching, if you have- uh, So I just want to really thank Laura, Jardis, uh, spending your snow day or the last of your work day, your school day with us. I uh, just really, really appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much. And while you were frozen on our screen, you may not realize that. I, I just wanted to let the audience know, the people that are watching, if you have specific questions about the film that you're dying to ask us, just email us at screenings, plural, at virulentmovie.com. Screenings at virulentmovie.com. You don't have to be requesting a screening. If you have a question, we're happy to answer it. So thank you so much, Dr. Carson and Murphy and your colleagues. This was really fun. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I froze. I'm not sure what happened, but hopefully, hopefully we got the point. Thank you everybody for joining us and go watch the film. <laughs> All right.